may be seated. As the last few uh, passages we've looked at have began, Paul again begins this passage with a question. <clears throat> that he, and he asks this question, he says, Since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? Paul recognizes who he's speaking to. He knows his audience. He knows that there's many who have come out of Judaism into Christianity, and there's probably still some that are there who are Jews, who have not converted to Christ. And for the Jew, the law had great significance. So the law was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, to Israel, and they agreed to follow God, to, to uh, walk in obedience to the law that God had given them. For them, it was how they related to God. In fact, by the time of Christ, though, many of the Jews considered uh, obedience to God's law uh, to be not only the demonstration of salvation, of salvation's godliness that God intended, but also to be the means by which they were saved, which God never intended. They thought they could earn their position before God through keeping the law, that faithfulness to the law actually superseded faith in God who had given the law. And so there's confusion about what's the, the, how does the law now relate to somebody who's a Christian. In fact, Paul was criticized intensely by his believe, unbelieving Jewish opponents for supposedly just disregarding the Mosaic law altogether. And why? Well, because Paul's made a number of statements about the law, and most recently in uh, verse, si or verse 14 of chapter 6, he says, For sin will not rule over you, because you are not under the law, but under grace. You're not under the law. And knowing that his readers, especially these Jewish believers, would still have many questions about the law in relationship to their faith in Christ, Paul begins to explain this relationship between the law and the Christians. And in doing so, he's also giving us another answer to his question in verse 15 of why we shouldn't and really can't continue in sin. Remember verse 15 from last week where he says, should we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Paul says, no way. And he explains that to be under grace is to be free from the enslavement to sin, that we have a new master, Jesus Christ. And we'll see here this morning that we have a new relationship, that we're married to Christ. And so Paul, in these verses, he's addressing what it means to not be under the law, how we're not under the law, and at the same time, how we fight against sin. And so the question this morning I want to answer to kind of tie this all together is as Christians, how should we think about the law? How should we think about the law as it relates to uh, this passage? Since we're not under the law but under grace, how do we view it? Is it bad, useful? Should we have nothing to do with it? And this is an important question because I think in answering that question or this question, we better understand our freedom from sin and how to fight sin. And this is what Paul wants for us, to better understand the freedom that we have from sin in Christ. So two primary points here this morning. First one is this, we are free from the law. We are free from the law. Paul says, since I'm speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? And asking this rhetorical question, Paul is providing a principle about laws. The principle is this, a law has authority over a person as long as you're alive. As long as somebody is alive, the law has authority over a person. But as soon as somebody dies, the obligations of the law are removed. Now, when Paul writes, do you not know the law rules over someone, he's talking about this idea, it lords over, it's a master over someone. It's expressing this domineering authority over those who are subject to the law. But this authority, Paul is saying, it's limited. It's limited to your lifetime. As soon as death comes, the obligations to the law are done away with. They are annulled. And to help us to understand this point, this principle, Paul uses an example, and the example of marriage in verse 2. He says, for example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while she lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So then if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. Then if she is, free, then if she is married to another man, she is not an adulteress. I think Paul's illustration here is somewhat pretty straightforward. In that time period, whether Roman or Jew, a woman was bound to her husband for life. And the only way she could be freed was through the death of her husband. If she married another person outside of the death of her husband, she was considered to be an adulteress. But what happened when her husband died? Well, she was free to marry again. The law bound her, but death freed her. It means the law was annulled or it was destroyed upon the death of her husband, that her death makes her free. Now, what is 
Paul's connection here, the application to us in the law. Well, verse 4, therefore, or as a result, here's what's true about you, my brothers and sisters. You also were put to death in relation to the law. You also were put to death in relation to the law. In other words, you died to the law, therefore you died to its power over you. Like this law about marriage is binding, so God's law is binding over us. It claims lordship over us as long as we live. But Paul says that bondage has been broken. It's over. It's completely done away with. How? Why? How have we been set free from the law? Well, verse 4, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ. Through the body of Christ. Through the literal and physical death of Jesus' body. In Colossians 1.22, but now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death. That Jesus came, God became man, a literal physical man. He lived among us and he lived a perfect life. And Jesus, because he lived a perfect life, had no sin of his own to pay for. In fact, by living a perfect life, what he did is he fulfilled the law's demands. All that came with it, he perfectly carried out the law. And Jesus then, he suffered and he died, the penalty for your and my sin. That he who knew no sin, Paul said, became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. That what happened upon the death of Jesus and believing in Jesus is we have been freed from our relationship to the law. That all of its obligations have been fulfilled in Christ. We died in Christ and just as the widow is freed from her relationship to her former husband to marry, so likewise with us. That this death in Jesus, that Jesus' death, and our bond between, uh, this death breaks the bond between husband and wife, so death, the believer's death in Christ, it breaks this bond which formerly bound us to the law and we're free to enter this union with Christ. That we've been released from the law. We have died to what held us because Jesus has set us free. Jesus has fulfilled the law, and to be in Christ is to die with Christ, and therefore to be free from the law. What does it mean to be released from the law, to be put to death? Well, one big idea is this, is it means that we're no longer under the condemnation of the law. The law no, has any, no longer has power to condemn us. Why? Why does the law not have any longer have any power to condemn us? Well, because we have died to sin, which in part means that we are no longer punished for our sin. Why? Because Jesus was punished in our place. He paid that penalty for our sin. Thus, the, the law is what prescribes the penalty for sin. But the law that prescribes the penalty for sin has no power. Its curse and condemnation has been on sin has been taken away in Christ. That we have been released from the condemnation of the law. As Paul says in Romans 8.1, Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set us free, set you free from the law of sin and death. That through Jesus, the condemning power of the law has been removed. It's been removed because Christ has fulfilled the law. But Jesus' death doesn't only release us from the law or break us from this bondage of the law. Jesus' death produces something. It produces a new relationship, a new marriage. In fact, verse 4 says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you, were also, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. And who is it that you belong to? You belong to him who is raised from the dead. See, something happens when you become a Christian. Salvation brings complete change of spiritual relationship. Your relationship completely changes. Just as remarriage after death of a spouse brings a complete change of a marital relationship, believers are no longer married to the law, but are now married to Christ. Christ, he is the bridegroom of his church. And marriage is a metaphor that is used throughout the New Testament to describe our relationship with Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, when Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, he says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a pure virgin to Christ. I've promised you to one husband. Who's that husband? Christ. 
Ephesians 5, Paul again, he's speaking of marriage in verses 22 through 23, and he's, he's giving instructions to how husbands and wives are to operate in this blessing called marriage. Then Paul makes this interesting statement in verse 32. He's writing about how husbands are to love their wives and wives are to submit to their husbands. And then he says in verse 32, this mystery is profound. But I'm talking about Christ in the church. Paul says, but what I'm talking about here, yes, I'm giving you instruction about marriage. What it means to be a husband and to be a wife and what marriage is. But I'm also, actually I'm talking about this mystery, Christ in the church. Meaning what? Well, marriage then serves is a beautiful picture of our relationship with Christ. That marriage is this picture, this metaphor of the relationship that we have with Jesus, that we belong to him and he belongs to us, which means we don't belong to another. We don't belong to the law. We've been released from it. We don't belong to sin. We've been set free from it. See, when you get married, what's happening in marriage? Yesterday, I officiated a wedding Two young people getting married, what are they doing when they're making vows? They're saying no to all other options. No to all other women, no to all other men. That in marriage what happens is you can't give your allegiance to another. Your allegiance is to one person. And see, as Christians, the law, sin, it doesn't possess us. We don't belong to them. So how can we go back to them? If you are a Christian, you can't, you won't is Paul's point. That being free from the law, it doesn't mean that we're free from any obligation, if you will. Free to just live life the way we want. No, we're actually, rather, we are brought into this new relationship, this marriage. That we're married to Christ. We belong to him. Now, for what purpose do we belong to Jesus? Well, Paul says this, the big idea, to serve and bear fruit for God, verse 4. You belong to him who is raised from the dead in order to do what? That, that we may bear fruit for God. The purpose for which we have been joined to Jesus is so we can actually bear fruit to God. It's so we can bear fruit to him, which means the law has no ability to, ha, to move us in a direction to produce fruit. And we had to be set free from the law in order to produce fruit. And because Jesus fulfilled the law and we belong to him, we are actually set up. We belong to him to produce fruit for God. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 2, you've been saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. How were you saved? How did you come into relationship with Christ? How was your sin forgiven by something you did? Paul says, no. The law, it never positioned you to save you. You can't actually earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do to cleanse yourself from your sin. Salvation is a gift of God. That God sent his son Jesus. Jesus died the death that we deserve to die to pay for our sin. This has all been given to us. This thing called salvation, this relationship with Christ has been given to us. It's the grace of God. But he says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. That we're his workmanship. That he has created us, and he's created us for a purpose. He's brought us into the saving relationship, this marriage to Christ, for a purpose to produce fruit. See, marriage to Christ produces something. It produces fruit. And what is the fruit of salvation here? Well, if you carry on the illustration of marriage in Ephesians 5, where Paul says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of the water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. What is the fruit? The fruit, holiness, Christ-likeness. Charles Hodge, a great theologian, he said, as far as we are concerned, redemption is in order to produce holiness. We are delivered from the law that we might be united to Christ, and we are united to Christ that we might bring forth fruit unto God. That the law had no way to bear, uh, for us to bear fruit unto God. As we'll see in a moment, the law just shows us that we are utterly incapable of bearing that fruit. And what Jesus did is he freed us from the law, he freed us from sin, and he positioned us to bear fruit, to be holy people. What does to be holy mean? It means to live like Christ. 
Who is Jesus? He is holy. He is blameless. And he's holy and blameless in his attitudes and his actions. That Therefore, to be a holy people is to be a people whose attitudes and actions are conformed to that of Christ. Our internal world and our external world. That we can be holy. That we are holy. That what happens, that marriage to Christ, salvation... It produces transformation, and the transformed life will bear fruit for God. We will be a holy people, people set apart from sin, moving away from sin to Christ. It will become more and more like Jesus Christ as we walk in obedience to him. And to provide clarity to this, Paul contrasts this fruit of Christ with the fruit of the flesh and living in sin. He says, for when we were in the flesh, in verse 5, the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear fruit for death. That we know, we've talked about this a lot here in Romans, but what is the result of our sin, of pursuing sin, of living in sin? Death. All kinds of problems. Divisions in our relationships, problems in our own life that we experienced from the sin that we committed and ultimately death eternal separation from God but in verse 6 Paul says but now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the spirit not in the old letter of the law in the newness of the spirit what happens when you are set free from the law and sin Is it so you can just live life doing whatever you want to do? Is that the picture of freedom or the picture of freedom is service unto God? It's to live a life of obedience to Christ. That we walk in the righteousness that has been given to us by Jesus. That we're free to be married to Jesus so that we can bear fruit to God so that we can serve God. This is the picture of the Christian life. We've been set free from sin. We belong to Jesus in order to bear fruit for Jesus. To the person who has been truly born again, whom the Spirit of God has come into, says, God, what I want is I want to honor you and serve you. I want to live for you. And in one sense, then, we accomplish the law in the sense that we live morally, upright, holy lives. But the law was not something that was able to produce that, only something it's only able to be produced through the Spirit. That as Christians, we now love and we serve God. Now there's a question that Paul begins to get into here, or he asks as a result of this idea of being released from the law in order to become holy, to become a righteous people. He says in verse 7, so what should we say then? Is the law sin? In other words, is the law bad? He's anticipating the argument. You know, in verses 1 through 6, he says that we were married to the law, but now we've been freed from it by our death in Christ, and we are married to him, to Jesus. And so the, the readers, the people who are listening, these, many of these Jews who become Christians, or even the people who are Jews who are not Christians, they're looking at this and they're wondering if the law, which we need to be released from, and is described as this old way of life, is the law itself bad? Is it bad? Like, should we have nothing to do with the law? Is it something we should just completely be done with? That if the law can't set us free from sin, if it can't actually make us holy, if if obeying the law, if you will, can't make us holy, and then we must die to the law in order to bear fruit. In fact, as we'll see in a moment, it actually activates sin in us. Then is the law itself sin? Is there something wrong with the law? And Paul says, no. Absolutely not. Emphatically, he's saying, no, you should not look at the law as bad or sinful. Why? How should we think about it? Well, here's what Paul says. Point number two is this, the big idea. The law is holy, just, and good. In verse 12, he says, no, no, the law, the law is holy. The the commandment is holy. It's just and good. Why though? Why is the law? Why does Paul describe it this way? Well, it's because of the purpose of the law. And there's three purposes to the law. The law defines sin, it reveals sin, and it condemns sin. But it's not the cause of sin or of death. What does the law do? Well, Paul says the law, number one, it defines sin. 
Notice what Paul says in verse 7. But I would not have known what the law, known sin if it were not for the law. Paul's like, I know what sin is because the law explicitly states what sin is. For example, he says, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. Do not covet. What does the law do? Well, the law defines sin. It's like a a sign. And it says, don't do this. And if you do this, you've committed sin. Think about a speed limit sign. Driving down the road, you, you know, okay, the speed limit, the law sets the speed limit at this speed, 60 miles per hour or whatever. And if you go past that, then the idea is that you're going too fast and you've broken the law. In other words, because God has revealed his standard of righteousness through the law, people are more accurately able to identify sin. And what is sin? It's failure to meet those standards. It's failure to do what God says we should not do. Do not covet. And then when we covet, we've transgressed the law or sin. So the law defines sin, which when you think about, this is why our culture in part is so mad about getting the Bible, getting God's word out of the public. It's because God's word identifies so clearly what is sinful. The sexual immorality craze of our culture, it's so clear that it's sinful. And so much more than that. The word of God accurately identifies sin. It says this is wrong. This is right. Because the law is based off who God is. And so in one sense, the law is giving us a picture of God, of holiness. What does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be righteous? And if we don't keep those righteous standards, then we've sinned. This is what sin is. It identifies, it defines sin. Second, the law reveals sin in us. Where is sin at? Where does sin live? I think oftentimes we want to think that sin is just out there. It's in the world. But what the law shows is that sin is actually in us. It lives in us. How does Paul do this? Well, you have to follow his argument here in verse 8. In sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Now what happened when Paul read the commandment, do not covet? Well, one, he realized that coveting was a sin. He realized coveting was a sin. Two, he coveted more. He coveted more. He desired others' possessions more and more. It says, sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind. Of every kind. What is Paul saying? One effect. What Paul is saying is the law aggravates or it promotes or provokes rather sin. It activates sin. Paul says, in sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me coveting of every kind, or this sinful desire in me, when the commandment came, sin sprang to life, he says. What, what's happening? How does this work? Well, Augustine talks about the simple answer being this, is that there's perversity in our hearts. What is perversity? Well, perversity can be defined like this, a desire to do something for no other reason than because it is forbidden. This desire to do something for no other reason because it's forbidden, it is a joy in wrongdoing for just its own sake. It's the joy of doing the wrongdoing just for its own sake. And Paul's point is, until the command against this evil thing comes to us, we may feel little urge to do it. But when we hear this command, there's this perversity in us that's stirred up. And may take over. Augustine, he describes this in Confessions, this idea when he stole some pears as a boy. He says, near our vineyard there was a pear tree loaded with fruit. Though the fruit was not particularly attractive, either in color or taste, I and some other 
use conceived the idea of shaking the pears off this tree and carrying them away. We set out late at night and stole all the fruit that we could carry. And this was not to feed ourselves. We may have tasted a few, but then we threw the rest to the pigs. Our real pleasure was simply in doing something that was not allowed. I had plenty of better pairs of my own. I only took these ones in order that I might be a thief. And once I had taken them, I threw them away. And all I tasted in them was my own iniquity, which I enjoyed very much. And Augustine asked himself, was it possible to take pleasure in what was illicit for no other reason than it was not allowed? Augustine's like, the reason I took them was simply because I wasn't supposed to, and I enjoyed it. And not much has changed in 1,500 years. We're told don't, and we do. Uh, in 2018, I went to, we visited my uh, sister-in-law and her family in the D.C. area. We did a lot of the D.C. stuff, but we also went to some caves while we were there. And uh, you're in these caves, and you see some pretty cool things like these uh, stalactites and so the next picture, even bigger, stalactites, stalagmites, stalactites, you know, they're hanging from the ceiling, the stalagmites coming from the ground. And if you've ever been in a cave tour, what happens when you walk by the stalactites and stalagmites? What do they tell you? Do not touch them. Now, what do you do? <laughs> you touch them. That's what you do. You feel it. You feel. Like, I'm walking by, and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool, that's pretty cool. And then you see the sign. Don't touch. Now what happens? You feel this in you. You feel that perversity. Ah, oh, I got to touch them. I'm definitely touching them. And you touch them. And then everything explodes. No, nothing. <laughs> they make it sound like everything's going to die when you touch them. Or I remember being in, uh, I think it was elementary school, and there's the solar, a solar eclipse. And we were going to go outside, you know, to check out the solar eclipse. And what do they tell you? Don't look at the sun. You will go blind. What do you do? I mean, you're like, I got to look at it. Is it true? Am I going to go blind if I, like, don't, if I don't, if I look at the sun? You got your goofy glasses on or whatever, and you kind of slide them down. And you're like, is this actually? Why? Like, you feel it. Like, when you're told not to do something, with kids, I mean, you look at kids, you look at your, don't do it. And they're like, they go do it. You're like, I told you not to do it. Why'd you do it? The, the do not command, if you will, it arouses sin. Where? Out there? No, right here. In us. And see, what the law does is it shows there's sin in us. There's perversity in us. There's wickedness in us. See, the law is like an x-ray machine. I have a few kids, and so we've had a few broken bones. And uh, my youngest daughter, they, uh, last summer, she's jumping on a trampoline, and she's bouncing with one of her brothers, and she came down and landed on her, on her leg funny. And so her leg was in pain. She wasn't walking on it very well. And so what do we do? Well, we took her to the doctor to get an x-ray. What does an x-ray do? It, it looks down beneath the skin. It looks at the bone to, say, to see if the bone is fractured or not. And so there's my daughter, Vail. She's wearing a pink cast last summer, you know, for most of the summer, just cast over her leg and I remember seeing her with it when she first got it on over her knee and I was like man oh that's like so claustrophobic to me but what happened well the x-ray machine exposed if her leg was broken or not what does the law do it exposes whether or not we have sinned if we're sinners and Paul says the law isn't the problem so you don't look at the x-ray machine and be like what's wrong with the, you know the x-ray machine there's something wrong with it. that's bad no, no, the x-ray machine just simply is exposing what is there. The law is not bad. It's not causing sin. It's just exposing it. In fact, sin is using it, but it's revealing this reality, this, this truth that sin lives in us. Because of sin, the law says don't covet, but our nature is like, that sounds fun and exciting, and so we decide we're going to covet. Don't lie. We're like, oh, I'm going to lie. There's this sinful, rebellious part of us. It's in us. That sin comes alive when we hear do not. And at the same time, what's happening is the law then just shows 
the sin that is in us. It's not out here that it's in there. It's not out there that it's in here. And so the law defines sin. It reveals sin. And lastly, it condemns sin. It condemns sin. Now, what Paul, I think, is doing in verses 9 through 11, and as he makes his way even to uh, chapter, uh, the next part of chapter 7, but in these few verses, Paul seemingly is using his own story of conversion to explain something that is true about all people when it comes to the law and sin, is that the law condemns sin. Paul says in verse 9, once I was alive apart from the law. Now, you think about Paul's life. He was a Jew, Pharisee. The law was a big part of his life. So Paul says, I, once I was alive apart from the law. Apart from the law can't mean that he lived life unrelated to the law. Like, I mean, that was his life. He lived his life under the law. So what does he mean? Well, it almost seems, certainly seems that he means that he never understood the law's real demands. He didn't really understand what the law required of him. There are all these rules, but he didn't get the thrust of the law as a whole, that it wasn't just about this external behavior, but also internally, that he didn't really have this understanding of holiness, of what it meant God to love, meant to love God above all else, what it meant to really love your neighbor as yourself. Thus, in that sense, he was apart from the law. But he says, I was alive apart from the law. And Paul seems to be speaking kind of of his own self-perception, that he felt as though he was spiritually alive. He felt as though his life was pleasing to God and satisfying to God. Why? Well, because he was ignorant. He was ignorant of what the law really demanded. But then something happened. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life again, and I died. When the commandment came, I died. Not that the commandment had just shown up at that point in time. The law had existed, but what happened? Well, that something happened that when the commandment came, Paul began to realize, wait a minute, I'm not pleasing to God. That Paul began to understand that he was under condemnation. He says very graphically, I realized I was dead is the idea. The commandment came and I realized I was dead. I thought I was doing quite well, better than most. But then he's overwhelmed by this sense of failure and condemnation. Why? Well, because the commandment came. Not like the commandment, all of a sudden the law appeared at that point in time. No, no, no. But the commandment, it came to life for Paul. It hit him in the face. He had a conscience and now the demands of the law, the morality of the law hit him hard, his conscience, and he came under what we would call what? Conviction of sin. That Paul realized, unlike ever before, I am a sinner. And he realized that he was dead, condemned, lost, because he had completely failed to keep God's law. No ability to truly keep the law of God. Though he'd been a proud Pharisee, standing, sure of his standing before God, he read the law and realized that he was a sinner who was in serious trouble. That the law, what it does is it brings this sense of death, of condemnation. It ruins the sinner. It not only reveals sin and arouses sin, but it ruins and destroys the sinner. It condemns. There's guilt and punishment that come for the person who is outside of Christ and in their sin. God's command promises eternal life if you keep them. But what's the reality? Nobody keeps the law. Nobody can. Nobody actually lives up to the full potential of what the law demands. That's why Jesus came and he says, adultery is not just something you physically do, but something that starts in the heart. That the law wasn't just about external behavior, but also this internal world that we have. There are our motives and our attitudes. And when we begin to look at our motives and, and attitudes, we surely understand, oh, I have not loved God with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. And see, what God's law does is it brings us to this point of conviction and condemnation. 
And Paul goes on to explain this a bit further in verse 11. He says, for sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. Why? Because sin used the commandment to deceive. You know, what does sin do? It is deceitful. It takes the command of God and it says, if you do this, you will have life. In the Garden of Eden with Eve, what happened? They're commanded not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What does Satan do? He comes into the garden and says, oh, you can do that. Don't you know, Eve, you actually, you won't die. You'll just be like God. And it twists the commandment. And it stirs up inside of us this desire, this, this perversion. And so we break the command of God. And we experience death. We experience death. And what the law does in part is it brings us to this point of reality where we see I am guilty. I am, have not kept God's law. I am a sinner. And I'm worthy of death. I'm worthy of death. And so the law defines sin. It reveals sin and it condemns sin. And so Paul says, no, the law is not bad. It's actually holy. And the commandment, it's holy and just and good. Because it positions the person to see who they are, a sinner. And it positions them for their need, the Savior, Christ. So in closing, just two applications, points of application. One is use the law when sharing the gospel. One pastor said, faithful preachers have always proclaimed the demands of God's law before proclaiming the gospel of his grace, or the grace of his gospel. That a person who does not see him or herself as lost and a helpless sinner will not see their need for the Savior. If we want people to truly understand their need for Christ, they must truly understand who they are apart from Christ. And what is going to move a person to see who they truly are apart from Christ? The law. Obviously, God and his spirit, but God is using that law that in Paul's life, the spirit of God, it's convicting Paul, but it's happening through the law. See, this is what sin is. Have you ever told a lie before, even a small one? Have you ever stolen anything before, even something small? Have you ever lusted after another person? Have you ever had hate in your heart towards somebody else? Charles Hodge, he writes, the law, although it cannot secure either the justification or sanctification of men, performs an essential part of the economy of salvation. It enlightens conscience and secures its verdict against a multitude of evils, which we should not otherwise have recognized as sins. It arouses sin, increases its power, and making it both in itself and in our conscience exceedingly sinful. It therefore produces that state of mind which is necessary preparation for the reception of the gospel. Conviction of sin, that is an adequate knowledge of its nature and sense of its power over us is an indispensable part of evangelical religion. Before the gospel can be embraced as a means of deliverance from sin, we must feel that we are involved in corruption and misery. We have to be broken. And unfortunately, what happens so much in our culture of Christianity is we never talk about sin in the law because we don't want to offend. But someone must be offended in order to see their adequate need for Christ. There has to be this sense of corruption and misery is what consumes me. Otherwise, the truth and the glory of the gospel, it doesn't mean anything. And when life gets hard, when things go bad because you claim to be a Christian, you say, what is this Jesus thing? No way. But if you understand the depths of your own depravity, the more you understand how wicked that you are wicked apart from Christ, so deserving of eternal separation from God, the more you see the sweetness and the beauty of the gospel. That's what we need. We must be faithful in preaching the law with the gospel. Lastly, uh, going with our identity in Christ, embrace your marriage to Christ. Embrace your marriage to Christ. This is what Paul is talking about. We've been freed from the law through Christ. We now belong to Jesus. What do I mean? Well, every day you will experience temptation. You'll be tempted by sin in big ways, small ways, however you define it. 
to lie, to lust, to be bitter, to not forgive, to steal, to cheat. You will experience that temptation. What should you do when temptation comes? How do you overcome it? Well, part of, part of Paul's point here is you embrace your marriage to Christ. You embrace what is true about you, that you belong to Jesus, not to sin. When the temptation for another woman comes in, it's, it's not an option. Why? Because I am married to my wife. I belong to her. That, that's why I reference, I, no, no, I have a covenant commitment with, you, with her, not with you. You see, part of the way that we fight against our own sin is to recognize this covenant relationship that we have with Christ. We belong to him. We belong to him. And so sin is, in one sense, it's not an option because I'm married to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. It's from this position, from our identity in Christ that we fight the temptation and sin that will come into our life. That we cling to him, that we need him to fight against our flesh and our sin. Let's pray. Father, we just, we need your mercy and grace. God, we, God, none of this is possible apart from you. We thank you for your law that has revealed that we are sinners. We thank you that Jesus came into the world to die for and pay for the sin that we have committed. God, we thank you that you have opened